He's well known in the sports world. Is that because you are uh, a, a, a champion or you have been a champion? I don't think you could ever call this gentleman anything else. Yep. Yeah. That was a yeah for baseball. All righty. Um, are you a pitcher? Yep. Arlene. Well, I just read a terrific story about someone that has been beloved over a long period of years and the Hall of Famer. Are you Satch Page? Yes. Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures. And right now, I am standing outside the home of one of the greatest baseball players in history, Satchel Page. This is his home in Kansas City. As I have seen photographs of this house with the upper floor completely exposed to the elements because it did have a, a big fire a few years ago and so they clearly have been able to put a new roof on it, which is fabulous. It's not open to the elements anymore. And hopefully someday this will finally be open as a museum. That's the goal for it. Satchel was born in 1906 in Mobile, Alabama. His name was actually Leroy Robert Page. And if you're wondering where Satchel came from, it came from when he was working in Mobile for the railroad. And he came up with a way of carrying the maximum amount of baggage. He rigged up a system using a pole that he hung all of the bags off of it and co-workers commented, you look like a satchel tree and it stuck. He learned baseball and pitching at the age of 13 when he was sent to a reform school for shoplifting. The man responsible for teaching Satchel about baseball was coach Edward Bird. He not only taught him how to be an amazing right-handed pitcher, he also told him that he could not depend on his physical talent by itself. Look how the batter has their feet placed. How is the bat positioned? If he analyzed these things, he could figure out the batter's weakness. Satchel wrote, quote, Those five and a half years there did something for me. They made a man out of me. If I'd been left on the streets of Mobile to wonder with those kids I'd been running around with, I'd have ended up as a big bum, a crook. You might say I traded five years of freedom to learn how to pitch. After they let him out in 1923, he joined the Mobile Tigers. At that point, he said, I gave up kids baseball, basically just playing for fun, and started it as a career. He won 30 games that year, only lost one. He then went and played for the Chattanooga Black Lookouts for two seasons. One of the things you could do in the Negro Leagues, you could not do in the Major Leagues. If you could get a better paycheck at another team, you could just go play for that other team. He played 12 months out of the year. He would play in America during the regular season, and then during the winter, he would travel to South America, and he would barnstorm down there for three years. He says he pitched every single day. It's estimated that in his career, he pitched 2,500 games, and of those, he won 2,000. The only stats that they're able to get are those from the Negro Leagues and Major League Baseball. Anything he did, barnstorming, a lot of his games in South America, there aren't stats for that. If you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, they acknowledge this. The stats do not tell you the story of Satchel Paige and his amazing career. He was f more than his ability. He was also a showman, a one of a kind. In terms of his abilities, he said his fastball was definitely in the 90s mile per hour range. He was 42 by the time he made it to the major leagues. I don't know if it was ever clocked. In his absolute prime, we can only imagine what his ability at a very, very young age must have been like. It did take him a while to learn to control the pitches. They tell you, I could throw pretty straight. I couldn't. I came up from down in Mobile when I was throwing rocks like you heard him say. I could throw rocks straight. I used to kill bird with rocks. There's no maybe so about it. 
But it's a, such a thing as I practice all the time. I just practice control. Anything you practice, you begin to come good at it. I don't know, regardless of what it is, whether it's baseball or not. I think I got so good in baseball once, uh, three and two, the batter was in a hole, not me, because I could get the third pitch in there just as good as I wanted to. He got to the point where he could throw nine out of ten pitches over a gum wrapper lying on the plate. In addition to his stunning athletic ability, he was extremely charismatic. He is said to have been a very, very positive person. His daughter said that every day in their house was Saturday. So much happiness and joy in their home. He was a storyteller, he was witty, he was funny, and he was a trash talker. His daughter said, I loved listening to my dad trash talk. He is known to have told his infielders to sit down, and then he would go and he would strike somebody out. He had this way of throwing off a hitter's timing. He would hesitate. He's one of the first people to ever do this. He had this long leg extension. He would windmill his arms. And one time he would throw it super blistering fast. And then the next he would throw it slow. And he was known to actually tell hitters, this is what I'm getting ready to throw at you. And then he would do it. He would strike them out. Even before integration, Negro League players would play against Major League teams in the offseason. And their all-star team was every bit as good as the major league players they faced. Here's Satchel talking about his teammates. We had men about the hundreds could have made the big league for that concern. By the hundreds, not by the four twos or threes. By the hundreds could they had more they had a lot of Satchel pages out there. Men could throw the ball hard as me. Here is Ted Williams in the nineteen nineties talking about hitting against Satchel. I'd seen him 14 years before when he was really, truly a great pitcher. And now, 14 years later, I'm hitting against Satchel Page. Doesn't have quite the speed he had. Doesn't have quite close to the speed he had. And I'd be ready at the plate. <laughs> and I'd say, boy, this guy must have been some kind of pitcher. Strike one, you know. Before I knew it, I'd gone 0 for 4 against Satchel Page. And finally, I got up there and I said, the hell with this guy. <laughs> Here's Hall of Famer Monty Irvin talking about hitting against Satchel. First hit batted against him. He struck me out four times. He said, Monty, he says, you know, I just want to give you a tip. He said, you'll never hit me. I said, no. Why not? He said, you hold your bat too high. He said, by the time you get the bat down and around, he said, I'm by you and gone. I said, okay. I tried to drop my bat a little bit. So in about a month, we played again. And you know, at that time, see, he only got me twice. So he said, see, 50% uh, improvement. I said, so you going to teach me how to hit you? I said, it doesn't make sense. He said, just because I say it doesn't mean you're going to do it. <laughs> I don't think anybody hit him successfully, you know. No. You get a hit off him once in a while, but that was you know, mere luck. He was uh, one of the best pitchers. I've ever. Satchel faced St. Louis Cardinals pitcher Dizzy Dean in six exhibition games, taking him four to two. Dean would later say that Satchel was the greatest pitcher he had ever seen, ranking him even above himself. And according to Buck O'Neill, Satchel was in his element when he was pitching against the greats, when he was pitching against a Josh Gibson. And Buck O'Neill is famous for telling this story about Satch walking players so he could throw to Josh Gibson. He walked one guy, then he walked Buck Leonard. Gosh, and that bat looked that long, man. And he said, Josh, remember when we played with the, playing with the Crawfords? We were traveling over the mountain, going east, and I, I said, uh, you know, I think you're the greatest hitter in the world. I know I'm the best pitcher in the world. And said, but one day we're going to be on the opposite side. He said, this is the time. Josh said, oh, throw the ball, Satchel. Okay. Satchel said, now I'm going to throw you some fastball, 95 mile an hour fastball. Boom. Strike one. He said, I'm going to throw you another fastball, but it's going to be a little faster than that one. Throw the ball, Satchel. Boom, 100 mile an hour fastball, strike two. He said, now, nah, you know I got the two strikes and no balls. Now, I'm supposed to knock you down, move you off the plate, but I'm not going to throw any smoke at your yoke. I'm going to throw a pee at your knee, 105 mile fastball, boom, right down the middle. Josh, don't move the bat. The ball game's over. We go walking off the field. Such a 6'4", and looked like he was seven feet tall. He said, you know what Nancy? I said, what, Satchel? He said, nobody. Nobody hits such a fastball. I say, I guess you're right. 
1937 to 1938 season, Satchel played in Mexico and in South America the entire year. This was because he had been suspended for breaking a contract or something like that. He had been suspended for a year. And while he was there, he injured his pitching arm. And there was a lot of fear that that was the end of his career. He came back to the United States and Jay Wilkinson, the manager of the Kansas City Monarchs, offered him a spot on his B team to recover. He spent his time there resting his arm, healing up, and within a year he was back on top. He would spend the next decade with the Kansas City Monarchs. It's the team he is most famous for playing with. His entire professional life, he spent the most time in Kansas City. It's why he's a legend here. It was after this injury he couldn't throw as fast as he used to. This is when he came up with the special pitches, ones that he would name. He called his fastball the long tom. Then he said, quote, I got a jump ball, a bee ball, a screw ball, a wobbly ball, a whipsy dipsy do, a hurry up ball, a nothing ball, and a bat dodger. When I was watching footage of him in the World Series in 1948, the commentator mentioned that the major leagues had banned his hesitation pitch. I guess it was too effective. In 1947, Major League Baseball decided to try integrating. This was the brainchild of Branch Rickey. In Satchel's opinion, it was done not out of a sense of right versus wrong, but rather money. Their exhibition games were extremely popular. People came out in droves to watch the Negro Leagues take on the Major Leagues. It was 50,000 fans that Major League Baseball could access. It made monetary sense. And since Satchel was the biggest star the Negro Leagues had, it would have made sense, you would have thought, for him to be the player they chose. But the fact that he was a star was part of the problem. He would have demanded more money than Robinson did. He was a bit of a carouser, bit of a drinker. Branch Rickey was a teetotaler. He'd never been to college. Robinson was more academic. He'd been to college. He had served in the Army. And he was very good at handling the abuse. Years later, it seems that Satchel came to terms with not being the first. Here's what he had to say. And they couldn't have used me because I had done played against all the all-star clubs in Los Angeles, and they couldn't have booted me around like they did Jackie, you know, with those things. Cause I don't know if I could have took that or not. I can tell you now, I wouldn't have took it because I'd have felt like I was bigger than that. I didn't have to take that, you know, to stay up there. But see, he did it and made the record, and I don't know, before Jackie died, he looked like he was my grandpa, so that, he, he got it going all right enough, nice, but it made him suffer a lot. He never, did get over, he never did get over it. He got his turn in 1948 when he was signed with the Cleveland Indians. His first game was two days after he turned 42 years old, making him the oldest rookie in Major League Baseball history. That record still stands to this day. The first time Page started in a game, 72,000 fans came to the game. As far as I know, that record still stands. And he helped get the Cleveland Indians to the World Series that year, making him the first black player to pitch in the World Series. And here's the announcement about the appearance of Satchel Page. Listen. He was with the Indians for two years. Then he played three years for the St. Louis Browns. Satchel quote-unquote retired in 1952. I don't think he really wanted to, though. And the reason I get this impression is from the oral history interview of him. He was asked if he was bitter about not being able to appear in the major leagues when he was in his prime. And he basically said no. The only thing he was bitter about was that he was not used effectively when he was in the major leagues. One the thing for Cleveland, and they wouldn't pitch me. They wouldn't stop me. He only pitched two-thirds of an inning in the World Series. 
uh, won the whole thing from, and they pitched everybody on the on the ball club but me. I, I have a right to be bitter because I was, after they found out I could play after I had uh, stayed out of baseball uh, 15 or 14 years, I was still cheated out of 15 or 16 years by Tony Melus in baseball. I don't know whether it was kind of my age or, or what it was, but I know they did turn me loose. But yeah, what I can tell you, I was pitching number one baseball. And how I got out and why they put me out, I don't know. Every time he started, the crowds were just phenomenal. It was crazy to not use him. And it was also crazy to make him quit if that's what happened. He was 158 days short of qualifying for a pension. And I don't know if he knew that when he was made to quit. But by 1968, he had realized this. Satchel reached out to 20 of the major league teams, asking them if he could join them for their 1968 season so he could qualify for his pension. 19 teams turned him down. Only the Atlanta Braves said they would take him on as a part-time pitcher and an advisor. The Braves' president, William C. Bartholomew, was quoted as saying, Satchel Paige is one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Baseball would be guilty of negligence should it not assure this legendary figure a place in the pension plan. Satchel was 62 years old. Satchel's last big league appearance happened September 25th, 1965. He was 59 years old. The Kansas City A's had been struggling for years. Ever since the American League expanded to 10 teams, they had been coming in 8th place, 9th place, and one year dead last. Attendance was abysmal. The owner of the team got this idea. What if we have Satchel Page night? He's a legend. Everyone loves him. Maybe it would get butts in the seat. But let's not only have a Satchel Page night, let's have Satchel Page actually pitch in the game. They brought him in and they asked him, do you think you could pitch three innings? He said, well, that depends. How many times a day? When they asked him about his age, he said, I think I can still pitch and help this club, so what difference does it make what my age is if I can? For this night, they invited other Negro League legends to come. Buck O'Neill, Cool Papa Bell. He signed a contract on September 5th. They gave him a $3,500 check for the three innings that he would pitch. They really made a show of it. They brought out this big rocking chair they had a nurse there. They had an errand boy to go and get stuff for him. And they made a big show of this nurse rubbing liniment oil into his pitching arm. He didn't have any gray hair, though. He didn't look 59. After this show in the beginning, they moved the rocking chair into the dugout, which was somewhat underground. And Paige said, at my age, I'm close enough to being below ground level as it is. In his appearance, he pitched 28 pitches to 10 batters in three innings. The catcher said that he, quote, he threw slow, then he threw slower, and he just kept getting outs. When they took him out of the game, the crowd booed, but they turned the lights off. People lit matches and lighters and then began singing the old gray mare as this great tribute to him. In his three innings, he had one hit, no walks, no runs, and he struck out the Boston pitcher. Unfortunately, the other team, they were playing the Red Sox that night. They made a massive comeback after he left the game, and the A's ended up losing the game and came in last place once again for the season. But 10,000 people came to see the game. The game before that only had 900 people in the stands. His journey to the Hall of Fame took 20 years. He hadn't even retired from the major leagues when people were already agitating to get him and other Negro League players like him into the Hall of Fame. In 1966, Ted Williams 
was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and he used that opportunity to argue that players like Page and Josh Gibson, Negro League players in some cases who never even got to the major leagues, they needed to be in the Hall of Fame. And he mentions Satchel Page by name. And I've always been a very lucky guy to have worn a baseball uniform, to have struck out or to hit a tape measure home run. And I hope that someday the names of Satchel Page and Josh Gibson in some way can be added as a symbol of the great Negro players that are not here only because they were not given a chance. And in 1970, a book was published about the Negro Leagues called Only the Ball Was White. And that really brought attention to the players of the Negro Leagues who completely lost that opportunity to even be able to have the chance to get into the Hall of Fame. And and within a year of that book coming out and the public outcry over it, it finally was agreed that Satchel would be put on the ballot. But then the museum said, well, instead of putting Satchel on the wall with all of the the big players, we'll make a special exhibit for the Negro League players in the museum. He won't be in the Hall of Fame. Oh my goodness, the outcry over that was unbelievable. The notion of Jim Crow in baseball heaven is appalling. What is this, 1840? Either let him in the front of the hall or move the damn thing to Mississippi. Those words were written by columnist Jim Murray in the Los Angeles Times. Privately, Satchel said, The only change baseball has made is to turn Page from a second-class citizen into a second-class immortal. Luckily, the outcry was so extreme that The Hall of Fame changed their tune pretty quickly. No, no, we'll put him on the wall in the Hall of Fame right next to everybody else. Currently, there are 37 Negro League players in the Hall of Fame. I hope they keep adding people as they study the records of Negro League players. But he was the first in 1971. He was alive to see it. Satchel was married twice. His first wife's name was Janet Howard. He said, basically, my lifestyle just didn't match what she wanted. She wanted a husband who had a regular job who came home at night, and that wasn't me. He traveled all over the country and all over the world. And he actually brought a woman home from Puerto Rico that he had supposedly married, but there's no way it was legal because he had never divorced his first wife. But his third wife was the real deal. Her name was Lahoma Brown. And they had eight children together, all raised in this house. Satchel purchased this house in 1950. He bought it two years after a Supreme Court case said that homeowners association covenants were no longer allowed to put in language barring black people from buying in their neighborhood. This allowed him to purchase this house and he would live in it until the day that he died in 1982. They raised all of their kids here. Obviously, it is a massive house. With eight kids, you're going to need a lot of room. But in addition to all of the children, he also opened this house up to black travelers. Often other Negro League players, but the Harlem Globetrotters were known to stay here. He died in this house in 1982 of a heart attack. He would have been about 75 years old when he passed away. And the family remained in the house. At the end, one of his daughters was living here. She expressed a lot of regret that she just could not afford the upkeep on it. It's an old home. It's 112 years old. And she was just drowning in all of the things that were wrong with it. And the the utility bill was just astronomical. It's a huge house. It's old. It probably wasn't insulated great. And she decided that it would be better for her to pass it along for someone who could afford to take care of it rather than for her to hang on to it and let it continue to, to decline. The family sold it to somebody that they did know, but that person also had trouble keeping up with the cost. They passed away and in 2004 is when the house became vacant. Well, it's been vacant ever since. In 2018, it had that horrible, devastating fire that was probably arson. 
And at this point, the family was trying to raise the $350,000 they needed to get the house back. At that point, the city owned it, and now it was very damaged. The city was able to get a $150,000 grant, which they used to repair the damage done by the fire, or at least the worst of it to put this new roof on, to seal it up tight against weather elements, keep vandals out, put up the fence around the house. And July, in July, they finally have put out plans on what they want to do with the building. They want to make it into a museum about Satchel. They also want to have rentable retail space so that there is a constant income in order to keep the house up. There is going to be an off-site building that will contain the gift shop for the museum. It's going to take about two years and three and a half million dollars to complete this project. I hope so much that that happens. Please go to their website. I'm going to put it in the description. Donate, support their mission. I'm sure that would be very much appreciated. I visited Satchel's grave while I was in Kansas City. He's buried in the same cemetery as Buck O'Neill, but I will cover him separately. Says he began work carrying suitcases at Mobile Union Station. Buys to sling harness for hustling several bags at once. The other red cap said he looked like a walking satchel tree. Thus Leroy became satchel and satchel became a legend. Leroy Robert Page married Jean Brown Lahoma on March 5th, 1946. Their kids were Shirley Miller Pamela O'Neill, Carolyn Mason, Linda Shelby, Robert Page, Lula Page, Rita Rogers, and Warren Page. This has a little biography of him. He rose above the humble beginnings of his native Mobile, Alabama childhood to become a national treasure and a universal sports hero. Among the most illustrious sports figures in the history of baseball, for 39 summers and as many winters, he traveled endlessly throughout the United States, Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic, thrilling millions with his extraordinary pitching feats to become the most celebrated moundsman in the history of our national pastime. Everyone knew him as Satchel Page, a legend in life and immortal in death. He began a 27-year second career with the Kansas City Monarchs and made this his home. Three big moments in his baseball career. He pitched a 5-0 shutout for Cleveland against Chicago in 1948 when he was inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame in 1971. He attended the dedication of Satchel Page Stadium here just three days before he died. That's sad. Great way to see how a baseball naturally deteriorates in the elements. <laughs> how to stay young. According to Satchel Page, avoid fried meats which angry up the blood. If your stomach disputes you, lie down and pacify it with cool thoughts. Keep the juices flowing by jangling around gently as you move. Go very light on the vices, such as carrying on in society. The social ramble ain't restful. Avoid running at all times. I heartily agree with that one. Don't look back. Something might be gaining on you. <laughs> yeah, if I'm running, kill whatever's chasing me. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Satchel Page. I will see you next time. Stay tuned for a couple of bloopers I had in this episode. Hope you enjoy it. Here's his advice on how to stay young. Avoid fried meats which angry up the blood. If your stomach disputes you, lie down and pacify it with cool thoughts. You're in the shot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to restore it? <laughs> how to stay young. It was just recommended to me to show you my epic find at comic-con i am not in my pajamas i swear oh yeah i'm a child of the 80s